Ernie will be covering most of the technical content today. Ernie's been doing this for a long, long time and is very well versed on, on this material. Uh, Griselda Alvarez is also with us to help during the Q&A, but more important than that, she's been all, doing all the work behind the scenes to make these events happen. And that includes all of the new technical papers and other content we've been putting out of, on this over the past few months. We've been trying to inject a little life and enthusiasm in, check, in the check valve world, which has mostly been driven by enthusiasm at the executive levels as we work together to improve outage performance and ultimately the economics that go with running a nuclear plant. Uh, nowhere is this more evident than at Susquehanna where their site VP has gotten very hands-on when it comes to testing versus disassembling inspection of check valves. And he's been act actively sharing that with his peers across the industry. Uh, as you know, anytime one of your senior leaders takes up the mantle in an area where we provide the primary support, we're going to do everything we can to support his or her objectives. So, so thanks, Griselda. We, we appreciate the content and the high quality has made this available and made that we're making available for the industry over the past few months. And then myself, I've been around the block a few times. I tested my first MOV at Surrey during the spring 1985, yes, 1985, refuel outage and it provided some level of out related technical support to every plant in the country and many internationally. Next slide. On the next slide there. No, Ernie, you're still not sharing the, the slides. There we go. All right, very good. Minor technical glitch, unexpected. For, for those that, uh, that didn't participate or have not viewed the first webinar, I closed that session by getting on my soapbox a little bit related to how long this technology has been in use. Uh, we started working on check valve non-intrusives, and that includes the acoustic and ultrasonic technologies discussed, we're going to discuss today when SOER 8603 was ready for issue a long, long time ago. I first tested with what we called Checkmate in 1988 at Utah State as part of a utility-sponsored initiative led by San Onofre. Uh, and it, that system was acoustics and ultrasonics, pretty much the same as it is today. There were a number of plants that participated, and our objective was to identify promising technologies for check valve testing. My point is, this stuff's been around for a while. 30 plus years, in fact, and it's been thoroughly vetted. The applications and limitations are well understood. We're not in R&D with this stuff. Oak Bridge evaluated check valve monitoring in the late 80s, including acoustics and ultrasonics. The nuclear industry check valve group went through a seemingly endless number of testing projects aimed at verification of the technology. The ASME check valve working group gave us appendix two in 1996. The NRC approved that when they adopted that version of the OM code in the federal, federal regulations in 1999 without comment or exception. EPRI looked at this just a couple of years ago and their 200, 2019 report was discussed during the prior session. So after 25 plus years of check valve NIT being allowed in the code, there's been no second guessing, no pullback from the original positions. This is still the way to go. Next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit more about how this is done, and Ernie's going to handle most of this agenda. I'm going to get out of the way here in a couple more slides. Next slide, Ernie. First, let's talk about trendable attributes. To have a meaningful test, we need to monitor and evaluate something that provides an indication of what we're looking for. If this were an MOV, we might look at available margin as a trendable attribute, or thrusted CST, or some other parameter we get from that test data. However, for most check valves, we're con that we're concerned with, there only, there's only one moving part, and that's the disc that rides on a fixed pin. Our concern is the integrity of that pin to disc connection and whether the disc can ride freely through the range of motion needed. It's pretty simple. There's no running load to measure, no available margin, no packing load, no rate of loading, stem factor degradation, or any of the issues we're concerned with with other valves. Simply, when flow starts, does the, does the valve move freely from one position to the other? And when flow stops, does it return to the original position? And while it's under flow, is it stable and quiet? That's what we want to know. Check valve NIT done right provides exactly what we need for check valve testing. Next, Ernie. 
A fundamental principle of the ASME code is to let the data tell us what to do and how often to do it. That's very clear in OMN1, now Appendix 3, where we can have a range of test intervals for MOVs based on the data. And this applies to individual valves and groups of valves. Grouping is a concept which I've never been a fan of, but it has allowed plants to set up certain test intervals based on group data. I lost that argument, and maybe my, my concern is a little overstated. The same is true for check valves in Appendix 2, and the guidance is provided in, in the appendix. But you must be clear about what you're measuring or monitoring and how, that, and how that answers the fundamental questions on check valve integrity and disc freedom of travel. Next slide. Recognizing some level of industry confusion on trendable attributes, the Appendix 2 Committee recently provided us a new definition for trendable attribute, which is approved, but not in the code until the 22, 2022 edition is published. That little tidbit is just formality. The definition is still what it is and will be. Next slide. And with what we know from the NIC program and others discussed earlier that CB check valve NIT data can be collected and trended in such a way that it provides exactly what we need from a trendable attribute perspective. So from here forward, I'm going to turn it over to Ernie. He's going to show us how we make this work. All right, I'm stuck on this slide. All right. So thanks, Stan, for all that information. I think a lot of you guys might know Stan. He's definitely been around for quite some time. All right. My experience has been that when it comes to trendable attributes, there's a lot of maybe confusion, might be the right word, or misunderstanding. I hear a lot of circles, a lot of discussion about what trendable attributes are. And I just want to go over what we've been using at quite some time. We'll show some examples later on in the presentation about how they actually work. But we've defined these um, and refined these over a period of probably 15 years or so. Of course, last webinar we talked about our primary technologies we're using as an OEM, Crane Nuclear. We have three technologies. We use an acoustics approach that actually is coupled with both the viewing technologies, ultrasonics, where we're pretty much using in water systems and eddy current where we, we like to use for rapid stroking testing with stainless steel systems. But in the acoustic front, we're looking at impacts. We're looking at rattling and, and contact of parts inside the valve. And with that, we're going to look at the rate of the impact, the magnitude of the impact, as well as the frequency content of the impact. So those three are our trendable attributes for acoustics. So in other words, as the impact rate changes, then we know that we're experiencing more clearance activity inside the valve. It could be likely wear as a result of time. Magnitude, of course, is just the, the energy levels. Of course, that can change as the part degrades. And then the frequency content, which is really important because in terms of the frequency, if you have less mass, you're going to have a higher frequency. So as parts degrade and, and wear occurs, you'll get shifts in your frequency content. Those are all actually gathered in what we call our power spectral density algorithm. So there's really no user interface required. It's just an automatic software algorithm that gathers that information. Ultrasonics is one of our premier technologies. We really rely on it a lot because it's linear. It provides us great details of information. It's somewhat more difficult to use in terms of, you know, interface with the individual. So you've got to be trained and understand what you're doing. But angular velocity is the primary cause of wear in a check valve. In other words, if the check valve is in a full open position and resting at the backstop, 
you're not really going to see any wear in the valve if the parts are stable. The position of the disc, which is measured in terms of degrees from the seat, is another indicator of the potential for inducing wear in the in the valve. And again, we're going to show a really good example here of trends that were done over a 20-year period at Three Mile Island. We're going to see these two major attributes, angular velocity and disc position change, and how they change as a result of wear. Stroke time is something that we can we can uh, accomplish based on software tools. It's probably not one of the more preferred or, or important attributes in check valve space. However, we do have the opportunity to trend that and with that see any potential hanging up of the valve. Sound path is another one, and we've got an example of that where, again, we're using a, a pulsed echo sound path technique where we're transmitting the sound. It's reflecting off of internal components of the operator. And based upon that, we're able to ascertain the position of the disc and those type of things. So we can do a really quick and accurate measurement verification of valve closure, which is a big one in ISTC space for the non-safety bidirectional position. Eddy current, which is a second look technology, where we've developed that for stainless steel valves. It's more prominently used in the pressurized water reactors. And we're able to gather stroke time and then the, the amount of stroke delta or that signal uh, change from open to closed position or as the disc may be moving. All again, very good, uh, accurate, and proven attributes. During the NIC phase four, which was uh, two programs that were conducted for determining the ability of the non-intrusive non technologies to, to find where based upon trends, all these technologies, these three were used, and you can refer to those uh, phase four reports because there's a lot of good information and a lot of good validation in terms of being able to determine and detect problems. All right, you may remember if you saw the last webinar, you may remember this slide, but I'm gonna show it again. If you look closely at that valve that's cross-sectioned, you see the ultrasonic signal, little green dots reflecting off of the disc in a closed position. And then top right, you see the ultrasonic A scan measurement, the bottom is just a software interface. And when that op trader moves, in this case, that disc moves and changes position, you're just basically looking at the principles of ultrasonic energy, you know, angle of incident equals the angle of reflection. So when the valve position is at normal to the sound beam, we get a reflection back and we're able to record that. In the open position, we're seeing that stability or instability of the disc as it's moving back and forth, the software is gathering that information, collecting that information, and then it projects that information into a stability classification, which would be one of three. We'll show that here in a little more detail. Then as the valve comes closed again, you can see that that sound path repeats itself. The accuracy of this device is three thousandths of an inch, so you know, once we qualify the closed position in this case, that coming in at about four inches, and we're gonna see any minute changes in that sound path as the disc may have not come fully close to the seat. This is not a category A type of a test validation. Again, there's, there's no leakage um, criteria that we're able to ascertain for this, but we are able to to use this a lot for category C check valves to verify that they're either open or closed in, in pretty rapid cessation of time, or again, in terms of the angular velocity. So it's either the sound path we're gonna trend, we'll show an example of that, or it's the angular velocity and the disc angle as it is positioned in terms of degrees off of the seat. Here's our stability classification. This is, uh, I find that the science in this that was developed 30 plus years ago continues to be extremely accurate in that that angular velocity is put into a stability classification. And that classification is based upon a range of stability 
number, which is the, the first case zero of the four. That represents a stable disk. Uh, essentially, it's either firmly against the backstop or it may be just looking at ordinary flow-induced oscillations. A lot of times you'll see certain valves have more clearance between the arm and the disc if it's a two-piece member, and that's there for design to allow that to settle and close properly. And those clearances could potentially be seen at less than four degrees. The next category becomes our unstable. Uh, back to the stable, that's just the valve that are experiencing normal flow and really we don't expect anywhere. The next category, unstable, it's not this particular valve classification. It's not stable or it's not excessive. So it's in between, it's moving and it's operating probably less than ideal flow conditions. We can, we can see this in terms of uh, maybe min flow, testing on check valves that maybe not totally uh, represent the the normal conditions of the valve. The other thing that's important about this category and even the next category, excessive, which represents that, you know, you're going to run that valve to failure if it continues to operate in the excessive category. And we've seen probably six operating cycles or so is a really good time to select for predictive maintenance on those valves. But one of the things that we're going to show in this example, the trending, that's uh, it's kind of interesting because back when we started to do all this, plants were running at 100%, but now we know there are plants out there in the fleet, the fleets that are actually um, base loading. They're, they're reducing power to support the need for the grid. And when you reduce power, then everything changes in terms of what you know your, your valve stability or instability to be. And this particular example I'm gonna show right now actually was the result of a power up rate. So this is gonna show when the power levels change, nuclear power plant, this main condensate valve uh, paid the price for in terms of degradation. So this itself is an 18 inch Walworth double disc swing check valve. It was actually a pretty 18 or 20 inch, maybe 22 inch, a large, large check valve at Three Mile Island. And it was actually vertically mounted, which even caused more of a problem because then you have gravity pulling the disc down and trying to maintain that valve in a stable state. So the main takeaway here, top left, that's the trend of the disc stability or the angular velocity as it shows on the y-axis. Those uh, x-axis points represent every two years. So this actual testing began probably back in the late 80, 80s, uh, maybe early 1990s when we started to do this work. And we can see clearly that the first five data points, which represents 10 years of testing, the valve has been relatively stable. I don't think there's a point on there that exceeds four degrees per second. But then all of a sudden at point six, seven, eight, and nine, we see some really abrupt changes. And again, through research, we're able to, to determine that that point six was between five and six is where the power up rate took place and the flows changed in that main condensate line. The other thing that's really interesting about this, and again, it supports our, our science, is the open angle of that valve remained relatively stable in a similar position for the first five data points or the first 10 years. And then all of a sudden we see changes, obscure changes in the open angle of the valve. So when that friction element starts to deplete, the disc in the arm, uh, the disc, in this case, the, the hinge pin and the bore, that friction element starts to deplete, then that disc is more able to move freely and just show up in positions where you wouldn't expect it to. Another thing about trends that sometimes I see People think that the valve has to look like it's getting worse to actually mean something, but research has shown, and either, you know, we've done a, uh, an excessive amount of research here in our flow loop in Kennesaw or, or phase four, NIC testing, but research shows that that data can actually, that point can change. It can go one way or the other way, and it's not so much you're concerned about 
an increase in stability number or decrease, but if there is a change occurring and a continuous change occurring, then you know something's changing inside the check valve. So again, lining up the disk stability and the disk open angle, you know, our software has the ability to trend and plot these points. Our owner, our user selected parameters where you can just go into the trend section and pick whatever you want to trend. If it's sound path, which we'll show you later. So the point again is during a power up rate, the valve became very unstable. Acoustics is somewhat of a different story. And again, 3.5 and 0.6 is where we see the major changes occurring in ultrasonics. And, you know, I, I say it often, but we put a lot of stock, a lot of value in ultrasonics. If the valve is showing that it's excessively unstable and we have impacting that correlates to that, we kind of understand. But looking at the acoustic data by itself, it can be misleading. We talked about this in the first webinar. The new reg talks about you know, the, um, the ability of acoustics to, to maybe mislead the interpreter. So you have to be real careful with the acoustics. You, you don't really want to put it in your top tier of, of uh, technologies for trying to really understand what's going on. But in data point five backstop impact, we, we can see that we've got higher magnitude there on the bottom left chart compared to the hinge pin time of arrival figures that out in terms of, a, of, of an algorithm. But the impact rate between five and six, we see a little change and, you know, based upon the flow conditions and, and the changing flow conditions, it's probably easy to, you know, to conclude that it was just a single uh, backstop, some, some backstop tapping going on. But then out at point eight, point nine, then it starts to change, um, but after that, the valve was taken apart. We never got another data point. But so it appears that the flow shows us a data point, 0 0.5, 0 0.678, appear to all be the same, which would, again, mislead you. But then out to 0.9 is where we're starting to see another chain. So again, we're not putting a great amount of emphasis on the acoustic information in, in this regard. We're really relying a lot on the ultrasonics. So after we recommended that the valve be disassembled, they found this particular condition. I don't have pictures of the hinge pin, but I know the hinge pin was a softer material and relatively relatively worn. But this is the, the bore, uh, hinge pin bore that's inside the valve body. And this, of course, fits and holds the hinge pin on that big check valve. So as that valve is oscillating, the disc is oscillating back and forth, it's causing this, this abnormal wear to occur, it's causing this elongation of the, of the bore itself. Eventually, if this would have gone untreated, uh, I would expect that that hole would have become big enough that the disc arm itself would have pulled the, the hinge pin down and the disc and it would have failed and probably caused the plant to shut down. A really good example, and this is just one of many we have for all the testing we do, but this is a really good example of how those trendable attributes can lead us to be able to make a, a scientific based conclusion about degradation and allow you know, our customers to get the opportunity to do predictive maintenance. You'll never get in a situation with this unless you've tested the valve for the first time and it's been in service for four years you might get to a point where you say, yeah, that valve really needs to come apart like right away. But when predictive maintenance is applied correctly and this testing is performed periodically, then usually you're gonna have a period of some refueling outages to help schedule that activity. And that of course becomes very helpful for plant scheduling. Here's another example of just using a sound pass measurement from the Paul Stecco ultrasonics. And uh, this was an aux D bypass check valve at St. Lucie. They do a significant amount of just closed verification, non-safety position, closed verification there. Using ultrasonics, you know, we can test um, at least 10 valves in one single day. So they've got it to the point where we come in before they shut down and just go and, and do a significant amount of testing. We can, 
potentially test 20 some valves in a few days. This, of course, is an example of uh, qualification in this particular, it's a small two inch Edwards piston style check valve. And we were able to take one off the shelf and put it into a, a tank and then cycle it knowing that it was on the seat and then compress the spring and then push it in a full open direction to the point where we know it was fully displaced. And really in this particular case, that valve, these valves don't stroke uh, an excessive amount of distance. This one, the top trend there shows that it's the open position. Now from the top of the valve where the transducer is, it's gonna be your smaller distance, shorter distance, because the sound is penetrating through the bonnet and then as the valve is open, of course, it's gonna be closer uh, to, the, to the bonnet. So we see 1.55 is the qualified baseline for the open position and 2.45, which is about nine tenths of an inch, I think, total stroke. And you can see three data points on the bottom for outages 23, 24, 25, where we have a, uh, exact same sound path of 2.45. And then one particular outage during outage 26, the stroke was only 1.94 inches. So, you know, it was very easy to, to make the conclusion that particular valve was hung up at that time. If you know anything about these small piston check valves or any piston check valves, they're, they're somewhat finicky and they, they will stick. In this particular case, that draw the picture, you can actually see where there's wear inside the bore that caused that valve to hang up. So it hung up at 194 and basically it was about 0.51 inches from, from the seat. They took it apart and basically all they could do was clean it up. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of breeze through this because a lot of this stuff is really no brainer for most people who've been involved in this. But at the same time, I, I did want to show how you can adopt your check valve program documents for non-intrusive. It's not that big of a task. You have condition monitoring plans. If you're an appendix two, right? If you're still in ISTC space, then first thing you have to do is you have to write condition monitoring plans. But this is assuming your condition monitoring plans are already in place because I believe the majority of the industry is uh, using Appendix 2. So your CMPs, really, they just basically need to identify a non-intrusive test method that is going to be capable of detecting precursors to failure and specific failure mechanisms. Now, if you're familiar with Appendix 2, um, I think it's paragraph 3000. Those are pretty much verbatim words out of 3000 that tells us what we have to do. So in other words, you know, there's a qualification of techniques that we'll talk about too, that is, plays a pretty important role there. Your, your CMPs as an extra value, they should contain a table where the non-intrusive analytical methods are, are indicated for detecting specific degradations. That's always really helpful, especially in the case, you know, of a peer review or an audit to show how well organized you are there. Uh, your IST program, insignificant changes really, you know, depending on the bureaucracy of your plant. You know, some may say it's really not an easy thing to do, but it would be based on, on bureaucracy. But as far as the actual changes, you just need to identify in the base documents that you're using non-intrusive. Of course, the specific frequency when you you know, maybe as you're extending frequencies, that could change, that could need revised. And then your, it's probably in there already, your, your site testing surveillance testing procedure usually becomes a reference. And that site surveillance procedure, of course, is something that exists. It's usually an operations procedure. And I found out that basically what we do, it's not that much work. Take that procedure and you see where they're flowing starting the pump or whatever, and you just include a step or two, you know, where you're collecting the data, and the acceptance criteria may be in there. So then you're addressing that STP and providing the, the mechanism. 
to conduct a test. Then that becomes, of course, a, a quality document, right? And a quality document then becomes filed as maybe an inclusion in, in your technique. Site surveillance tracking, everybody knows that you know, that's how things are flagged. That would require a change if frequencies change. The field test procedure, you know, that can vary. That can vary from a one page to a 30 page document. Generally, what we'll do is we'll provide our customers with ours that we have, and then we'll just change the heading. It's usually, if you're transitioning into non intrusive, then it's usually going to be a brand new document. It's going to address the actual NIT performance step by step of setting up. Acquiring data. This NIT technique qualification, this is something that I think is overlooked in certain situations, but it's, it's pretty important because NewReg 1482 addresses it that you, know, you want to be able to, that technology has to have been proven to find that particular degradation or the condition that you're looking for. And that best way to, to cover. That is, you know, after the techniques done, we've done this with, with a bunch of customers, perform certain, certain qualifications with, you know, maybe some unusual valves, nozzle check valves or whatever. Great procedure to do it. You do the testing on a bench and then you, you file that as a quality record. It's, uh, it's probably worthwhile to note that the NIC testing should be and could be considered for the technique qualification. NIC phase one, two, three, and four, a lot of different style design check valves that you could probably get information and use those as technique qualifications. Training qualification of personnel, of course, it's gotta be compliant with QA program. You know, again, as, a, as an added bonus, I think, if it would consider requalification and proficiency demonstration. And we talked, I think last time we talked about some of our customers doing this uh, this work in between outages, a lot of times they'll bring us in during outages to help out with the increased load. But a lot of times that when they're doing testing on their own in between, that, that actual work can be credited as proficiency demonstration. And, and it's good to you know maintain proficiency, continue to demonstrate it with this. All right, Stan mentioned early on, you know, we got um, very high level support at Susquehanna to the point where the site VP and plant manager just really drove this program. Anybody who knows Susquehanna knows that they've had a very extensive disassembly inspection program over the years. And I know it was a good program because I know Ken Hart, I worked with him very closely. It was a, a pretty extensive program, but their vice president actually had come up through the ranks and, and as a maintenance guy, you know, I think he had a real appreciation for how many hidden things that can go wrong when you take a perfectly good check valve apart. So we're gonna talk about our support of that condition monitoring program. So our objective was just to really enhance their check valve IST program, specific areas, right, to facilitate the Appendix 2 NIT adoption. And I, I say this often, and non intrusive is definitely not gonna answer every question or every problem you have. If you've got a raw water system and you know every outage, you're finding biofoul in it and it's hanging up, those type of situations, there's really no sense in using non intrusive. But if you're talking about a safety system, a lot of times a safety system which sees basically no service at all, maybe an hour or so every quarter, it's pretty impossible for that thing to ever experience any accelerated wear. Depending on the design, you know, it may be an issue of sticking open or whatever, but wear's not gonna, not really gonna be the case. And, and then BOP systems, right, where you're, you're doing PMs, you know, again, those PMs can be validated, and we do this a lot for our customer base, they may have a disassembly PM, but then we may go in and do the non-intrusive test, and based upon the stability classification and the other information, we may be able to very confidently say there's really no need to take that valve apart, and they'll use the non-intrusive in terms of uh, extending that out. 
So you know, went in there last before the last outage, reviewed the outage disassembly inspection scope. You, you find a valve that's on a disassembly inspection scope, and you see something like you know seat change out or modification here or there. I mean, if that's essential work, then then it really needs to be done. So they might not be the best candidates at that time, although they may be after the modification or the you know the engineering change, design change, whatever it is gets gets conducted. Then we really just looking at providing the recommendations, the best recommendations with the best candidates. And again, most of these just become safety system valves or BOP valves where the maintenance history might show that they're operating okay. You know, you don't really have any any grave problems or concerns. And then it was a matter of revising the condition monitoring base documents like I talked about a little bit earlier. In this case, we tested some HIPSI and RICSI valves uh, safety systems, of course, and looking for valve operator stability and just the overall condition. IST valves, you know, did they did they bidirectionally exercise? Uh, it's appendix two, so it's not full open, but it's bidirectional functionality is what the code requires. We also included a couple BOP valves that were scheduled to have a main feed water pump discharge check valve, which probably saved them 100,000 plus just because of the evolution, the location, uh, everything involved in that disassembly inspection. Did one on a control rod drive pump discharge check valve, a nozzle style, so they could remove disassembly a PM from the Audi scope. And again, using basically our algorithm to provide this stability information just regarding the propensity experience accelerated wear and giving them a high level of confidence that the valve's not going to wear if it's stable, if it's if it's sized properly. Then of course we supplement it with acoustic emission power spectral density as talked about the PSD, just an automatic algorithm where the software just collects the information. And in all cases we're able to determine that the valves are stable, they exercise the way they should have. We didn't expect any accelerated wear to occur. And currently, right now, the spring outage of 2022, looking at a, a scope of probably now maybe double the five that we originally did. I find this is fairly common when we'll go in and do a couple to maybe just prove it works well or improve the confidence or increase the confidence of the plant. Then, you know, the population of valves, they start to find other ones. So we're looking at a scope of about 11 that will be involved in doing the spring of 2022. Same thing, we'll be looking at disk stability verification uh, position and, and looking at any potential for the valve to experience accelerated wear. And that concludes the technical portion. Uh, Brazil is gonna get on and we'll see if we can do maybe a Q&A. All right, thanks, Ernie. I'm not, Griselda, I don't know if she was, has questions for us to respond to yet. I don't, haven't seen any pop up, but thanks for that technical content. You know, as, as I was discussing at the very front end, I mean, there's just a couple of things we're really looking for, right, with, with this. There's not a lot of complexity with check valves like there are some of the other valve types. Um, really, is the valve stable, right? And, and the UT provides that answer. Is it when it goes from one position to the other, especially in the open direction, does it sit peg okay, against the backstop or stable, or is it sitting there fluttering in the flow stream? And if it is, then we know that that disc is rotating around the hinge pin, or both are moving within their slot. And if that's the case, after a certain amount of time, and mechanical engineers know how to calculate that, it's going to wear out, right? And sometimes it's it's not in a week, it's not in a month, it may not even be in a year or two, but eventually it, it, it's it's going to wear out. So we're looking for that. And if that's the case, and we see instability, uh, then the acoustic data is going to give us an indication of how fast it's wearing. If we, you know, when it's brand new, it's really quiet, and then over time we see it bouncing around, like uh, you know, creating noise, kind of like a baby rattle, as we used to call it. Then we're getting gaps. We have space. So that those are the types of things we're looking for to tell us, hey, it's time to go back into this valve. But like I said, that's not something for most valves that occurs overnight or 
even in the same year or two. It, it, it takes some time. But the data gives us that indication that we need to tell us that we need to go back in and look at it. And, and then, you know, looking at its cycle and it, its range of motion, very important uh, uh, trendable attributes that, that we need to look at. So thanks, Ernie, for, for going through. I think that first example was really good uh, for explaining the two uh, different technologies and how they work together to tell us what's going on. Um, I would like to point out before, before we uh, finish up that uh, we're looking at uh, scheduling a demo day for, uh, for uh, anybody that wants to come here in uh, Kennesaw in the flow loop. We can uh, put a number of different valves in the flow loop. We can change, as a matter of fact, my computer's sitting on a big uh, stainless check valve right here that can actually swing over and go in and, and we can test on it as well. And there's some others here that we can do that with as well. And if if anyone has a valve that uh, is unique and you want to start doing uh, check valve NIT and we need to do some baseline testing, we can bring that in and, and, and test it or figure out a way to do it at, at, at plant. So uh, if you're interested in coming for a, a demo day, just let us know. Uh, there'll be people following up on, on this discussion. We'll send out email with the content, including the link to the video so that you'll have this for future reference. But let us know if you're interested in that. We'd like to do it sometime this late summer uh, before we get into fall outages. So, uh, so let us know if you're interested in that. Griselda, anything in for follow-up? Yeah, so if you guys have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A section. Can you guys hear me okay? Microphone, Griselda. You can't hear me? All right. Uh, Griselda, you're, you're muted. We couldn't hear that last comment that you made. At least I couldn't. Did you hear that? Okay, I couldn't hear. Okay, go ahead. Are you able to hear me or no? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Okay. Um, so, Ernie, we've got a couple of questions that came in. Um, the first one was, after performing corrective maintenance as a result of an identified that degraded condition. Okay, in the absence of any questions yeah. coming through. Oh, in the... oh, we got Sorry, okay, I'll read that again. After performing corrective maintenance as a result of an identified degraded condition, what is the appropriate period uh, needed to build a new trend of NIT data? So if you're talking about a trend, you have to look at the definition in the code, which is telling you two or more, I think, I don't know the exact definition, but it would be two data points. Some may consider that not sufficient, but I think in terms of code space, if you get two data points, then you're in good shape. Okay. And then the second question that came in was um, somebody that said, looks like a good bit of the technology relies on trending over time. So is there a period initially that both NIT and DNI will be required until you get enough NIT data to gather baseline data to be trended against? That, that's another really good question, but it's a question that I think best way to explain it is that in, in terms of the code, non-intrusive testing is considered as an equal to disassembly inspection. But they're both considered other positive means. And the, the main purpose of the code is to flow test the check valve. But if you can't do that, then it talks about disassembly inspection. But non-intrusive, of course, has been determined as other positive means. and. Uh, generic letter 8904 position one, of course, it shows up in, and is recognized in the OM code now. So it would actually not require a transition of doing a disassembly as well as doing a non-intrusive. I've tested valves for the first time that were significantly worn and we're able to say, you know, you should take that valve apart and repair it where we tested valves that show to be very stable and not really require, you know, any uh, immediate action, but periodic testing, which might be, you know, when I say periodic testing for non-intrusive, it's probably every refueling outage, you know, every cycle, 
if the valve is in, in good condition. If it's, you know, excessive and you've tested it for the first time and you want to gather more data points, see if, if degradation is occurring, you know, then you may want to test it in a year or so and gather those data points. So it's just a matter of your comfort level with non-intrusive. And that's one of the reasons why we're holding the webinars is just to increase the comfort level, you know, of, of the, the check valve NIT community, if you will, in that the technologies are sound. You know, Stan reiterated that again. They're, they're sound, they're proven, they're vetted. A lot of uh, industry time and, and money spent on validating. You know, and if it's a valve where it's a condition that we're not able to assist with, you know, if the technology doesn't fit. Again, the example I gave was if it's a raw water valve and, you know, I've, I've seen raw water valves have to come apart every outage and they really do because they're always going to be fouled up somehow. So non-intrusive really isn't your best bet, but this assembly would be. But again, to answer that question, just non-intrusive could be used. If you have disassembly history on the valve, that's something that we'll also look at, you know, and, and, and use that to our benefit. Another question that came in uh, was how to perform testing for double door wafer type check valves in raw water system. Yeah, so double duo disc, double door, uh, depending on the manufacturer, they've got different names. Those we test those just like a swing check valve because it's pretty much the same design except there are two halves to the disc. And it's, it's a valve that requires that we test both halves of the disc because I've actually seen those valves in certain applications where one half may be fairly stable and the other half may be unstable. And the unstable half will certainly make the stable half need repair because if, if half of it's bad, the whole thing is bad really. So we test both halves. Uh, probably at about a three and a nine o'clock position with ultrasonics. Position our accelerometers as best we can, you know, to try to, to zero in on, on each side. It can be a little more tricky one half to the other half. But again, if there's angular velocity, if there's a high level of, of disc flutter in the valve, uh, I, I guess I could say two biofoul will eventually affect the angular velocity. But if you know the valve needs to come apart every outage or every two outages, that's probably your best bet. Non-intrusively, if it's a raw water system, but if you may not be dealing that much with biofoul, you know, the non-intrusive could be, you know, it could be applied in some regards to, you know, to kind of show if impact rates, if they exist, if they're being muffled by, you know, by raw water material or whatever the case is. So essentially test one half, then the other half. Okay. Um, and then another question that came in is, have you seen utilities that have adopted NIT testing but have not been using it properly or effectively? You know, I, I think non-intrusive is, it, it's a science. It's an accurate science. And, you know, there was a day where the term black box was used often. And to some degree, back in those days, 30 years ago, some of the stuff was a black box, actually. But, you know, again, we're, we're talking about a lot of OE, a lot of, you know, success stories uh, that we've continued on. And I, and I think most people know, you know, it's not perfect. But, you know, if we were out there falling on our face or people were falling on their face everywhere, we'd probably hear about it. We do hear about it in terms of OE from time to time. But I think... The industry itself has put a lot of pressure on people at the working level because I've seen internal people training their replacements. And, <clears throat> you know, I don't know how this comes across, but we, we are the OEM. And when you're the OEM, you know, you're, you're going to hopefully you're going to know more than anybody else about your equipment. We've got some really good resources. I think everybody can benefit from going to the crane training, you know, to get it, to get started. 
and I think anybody who's ever worked with us knows that we're we're very flexible and we're very willing to provide as much information as we can to help the person out. You know, if it's help you out on site or if it's help you out over the telephone, wherever the case is. But I think, you know, there there are some lack of, of understanding of the technologies. Personally, I think one of the things I would really like to see and before I exit this industry, I'd like to see people get away from using acoustics only. I think that's one of the biggest misunderstandings that applies. If you're just using it for the fact of looking for an impact and the data means nothing, that's probably okay. But if you're using it to make any kind of assessment about the valve condition, I think you're really going to be hard pressed to do that. And I think, you know, the industry already shows that. So yeah, everybody, we can all learn, you know, we can all continue to learn. Again, the webinar, I think, is a good forum for us to share our experience, but you know, I, I, I learn something new mostly every time I go out there. There's always something, always something to learn from. So again, to wrap that up, I would suggest if you haven't been through OEM training, you know, you, 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 you go to OEM training. We've got a, an online course coming up in August. Or is it a in-person course coming up? In? So we've got a an online we've got a course coming up in August. It will be on our website if you're interested in that. And it, you know what? My information is available. Anybody's willing to call me anytime if they have any questions. I'll do the best job I can to try to answer them. I think that was the last question that came in, Ernie. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. If you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to contact us. We'll be sending out the recording um, as well as a Q&A document uh, for you all to have that documented. So thank, thank you all for joining. Yeah,